to say, this has changed my outlook on the Prowler. You know, we all have uh, prejudices about certain cars or certain people, whatever, and they're not fair until you actually really experience it. acceptable acceleration for the period 25 years ago. Not bad. Welcome to that episode of Jay Lone's Garage, the car we're featuring today, 1999 Plymouth Prowler. I'm smiling because this is a car I think could have been great if it just had had a better powertrain, but they were so out of money by the time they reached production. They had to go with all off-the-shelf parts. The 3.5 liter V6, it had 253 horsepower in 99, a little less than that when it, it debuted. There was no manual transmission. I mean, people were stunned that this thing reached production because it debuted in 94, and people couldn't believe that Plymouth, the kind of boring, staid car, you know, everything they had was Plymouth's doing okay, but they weren't setting the world on fire, but they were good, reliable cars, and this was such an outrageous thing. Some interesting ideas, I mean, a lot of aluminum in the chassis, which nobody was doing really in 99, and 20-inch wheels, which was pretty crazy in 99 as well. Uh, nowadays, it's fairly common. You got 20, 21, 22, even 23s, but back then, it was sort of new. I think it's a really cool-looking car, but it, there's, there's no trunk space, it's just a lot of things. But the most fascinating thing about this car is, as boring as the engine and the drivetrain were, I think the looks are pretty exciting, and you're gonna be surprised to find out who was behind this car. He was a young student, his name was Chip Foose. Chip, come on in, buddy. <laughs> you all know Chip Foose, overhauling, a legendary builder, uh, SEMA, won every award in the world. But this was like, were you a student at the time or no? Yes. It, uh, you know, for me to say that I designed the Prowler would be a slap in the face to all the engineers. Well, no, no, but I mean, okay, I, this is why I know I was tiptoeing around. The, the sketches came from you. Yes, and a model. And the model, right. But Chrysler came to Art Center and asked us to create a niche market vehicle. And when I was a student at Art Center, if you were drawing hot rods or muscle cars, it was very frowned upon. Right. You know, they wanted you to only focus on the future of automotive design. But I was a hot rodder in my past. That's why I grew up building cars with, right. with my father. They asked us to create a niche market vehicle. And the, and the example they gave us was a guy that likes to work out on an exercise bike, might charge a battery you can put in your car and get to and from work that day. So I did about five different proposals based on what they wanted. But I did a second proposal at home so nobody would get upset of all muscle cars and hot rods. I right. looked at also Cudas and Challengers and right, right. You know, the cars that, that we all know and love from right. the 60s. But I went all the way back to the 30s and I did this second presentation, didn't tell anybody at school about it. And Tom Gale, who was the president of, of design at Chrysler at the time, he's the one that we were presenting to. So I put both proposals up on the wall. And when it was my turn, Tom came up and he says, okay, I know what you're doing here, but what are you doing over here? And I said, well, you asked us to create a niche market vehicle, which I did here. And everybody in this room did that. But you're also asking us to create a customer. What I'm doing here is I'm catering to customers that exist. I said, there are thousands of people out, out, out there with hot rods and muscle cars trying to put modern technology into them so they can enjoy them on a daily basis. And I said, it's not today's designer's fault that a designer in the past chose to go away from a great form. We can go back and grab from forms that were fantastic in the past and evolve them into something new. I said the two best examples of an evo you know, evolving design, I would say is the 911 right. and the Corvette before the C8. It right. made that large leap. But I said, we can go back and draw from that and create something fun. And I had done some hot rods and some muscle cars and I did one sketch of a plan view of a 33 Plymouth and the side view of a 70 Cuda. And I did this sketch and, and Tom Gale just fell in love with it. And he says, well, which one do you want to build? I said, well, I'd love to build one of these, but I know you want me to do something over here. He says, no, I want you to do the hot rod. 
and I went ahead and built a model in that class. It's fascinating where, you, where the genesis of these ideas come from. I mean, you go to colleges and you talk to young people like yourself, <laughs> you know, and you find out what they see as the future. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was staggering when it came out because people couldn't believe what Plymouth? I mean, it was so unbelievable that, that Chrysler Corporation would build this car. What's interesting is Boyd Coddington also built a car very similar. It was Larry Erickson's design called the Illumicoupe. Oh, okay, sure. That came out just about six months before this did. Boyd Coddington saw the model. He asked me to start working for him. I was doing some work with him as well as Larry Erickson. Right. You know, that led to a career in this because yeah. if I hadn't done that model, I probably never would have started working with Boyd. Now, let me ask you another question. I imagine when you designed it, it probably had a V8 <laughs> with a four-speed or well, a manual. Well, I actually had a Hemi sitting in the back. Oh, you had it in the back. Well, I had done, I had done several drawings. I right. had done coupe versions. The model is a coupe with the, mo with the motor in the back. Right. But I had also done some convertible sketches as well. The model is much easier to build as a coupe because I could paint the windows and not have to worry about drawing you know, or building the whole interior. Were you stunned that it had the V6 with the automatic? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because to me, it was all about building. You know, a hot rod right. is a performance car. Right. You've designed this outside to look like a hot rod, but it's grandma's car. It just didn't go together. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, I, I can't imagine. You, yeah, I, I designed. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I wanted a performance car. And we actually built one for Dick Marriott. And John Lingenfelter put a Corvette V8 in it and the transaxle, did 11.23 in the quarter. But we also modified the. The body, well, but you know, that's fascinating because I was told, at least the press said at the time, there was no V8 that would fit in here. It's too tight. Well, it, it fits. You got to modify some things, but right, of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, you can't put a but Corvette engine in that. Yeah. There's a lot more room here than in a 32 Ford. Yeah, I guess that's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it was. Fa I mean, these bumpers are so cartoonish. Yes. But yes, it works, and to have a cycle fendered production car, that hasn't happened, well, I guess since the cycle cars of the 20s, really, nobody, yeah. had, nobody had ever done anything like this. And my model originally had the, the fenders on it as well. I sent my model back to Chrysler. They, they wanted it for something. Right. I sent the fenders individually wrapped right. in, a, in a second box. And when they shipped it back, they put the model in a box and left the fenders on it. And they all kind of slid around and then got broken up. So oh, geez, I've never fixed them, so I have the model without fenders now. Oh, all right. <laughs> did you also have 20-inch wheels? You know, it's interesting. When they did the 20-inch wheels, the biggest wheel you could get at that time was 16. Right. And Goodyear built the tires for this, and we used it. I was actually at Boyd's at that time, and we were building another car, car called the Roadstar. Right. And we used that tire, that mold, on the Roadstar as well. Oh, interesting. But well, it was wild that it went from 16 to 20, and this is the show car that they came out on. And I guess now the first year this came out, they were all purple, weren't they? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the colors came later. Uh, I remember seeing a couple of them around, and people went crazy. Oh, it's a V6? Because <laughs> now the V6 yes. has sort of earned its medal, so to speak. You know, I mean, the new Ford GT, Z6. but in 99, mm -hmm. A V6 was a grocery getter motor. You could make America. this, with a V6, you could now make this a performance vehicle. Yeah, you probably could, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. But nobody really tried. I mean, this is pretty much the drivetrain from the minivan, right? I believe it was the LH platforms. Well, here's my favorite thing. When you bought one of these, you got the Prowler <laughs> CD, you got the Prowler song. I have no idea where they were. We I can't never play it for that. you because then we have to pay royalties and who wrote the song. It's just crazy. Can I take that with me so I can hear it on the way home? Actually, it goes <laughs> with this car. I didn't um, know that existed. You also, you got Ruby Baby, Rawhide. I guess that's from the TV. Yeah, Rawhide, what's his name? <laughs> um, Kicks. Kicks? Yeah. Kicks, yeah, that's it. I think Kicks Not Route 66? I don't see Route Get your six. Kicks on Route 66? No, Kicks was the song by... Uh, Paul Vere and the Raiders. Okay. Remember they used to have like Revolutionary War hats. Yeah, it didn't really work. Mm. And of course, everybody's favorite song, Red Hot Roadster. Classical Gas. Well, I know that one. You got Purple Rain. Hazy Shade of Winter. Snakeskin Cowboys. Wild Thing. Dueling Banjos. Dream Baby. Best of My Love. 
and the 1812 Overture. I'm not quite sure why the 1812 Overture is there, but okay, they really were, <laughs> I don't know what market they were trying to reach. I mean, I guess they're trying to reach people who, you know, I remember years ago when there was, remember when the Zimmer and all those yeah. kind of cars came out? I remember I, I, I ran into a old guy, he'd be a young guy now, but for me, I was probably in my 30s, he might have been, so he goes, he goes, you got the classic look with a modern Mustang engine in it. It's fantastic. I just thought it was the most horrible thing ever, but <laughs> to him, it was something, it was a hot rod, it was a Duesenberg classic looking car that he could drive every day right. that had brakes and, you know, so I understood. And that's kind of what this was. They really were not trying to appeal to the Mustang buyer or even a Corvette buyer. They were trying to appeal to the cruisers, I guess, the guys who just want to kind of look cool or, yeah. you know, hey, I just got divorced, I'm going out. Yeah, thank you. You know, I mean, I, I don't know what, what was happening, but it was not a sales success. No, but uh, it, it, it made the point, though. It put, it put Chrysler on the map. It, it, it is interesting. Everybody I know that owns one, yeah. they love it. Yeah, I, I can see how you, I mean, because it's so quirky, it's so different. And you get attention in it. If you knew nothing about cars, wow, that's, that's a wild looking thing. You know, it's just that, that, that's what the attitude, it just doesn't have the performance. It sort of grows on you. I didn't like it at all when it first came out. Yeah, and, if you wanted to go grocery shopping, you had to get the trailer. Oh, oh yeah, that's right, it came with a matching trailer, didn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and how much was it? I don't remember, it wasn't inexpensive. It wasn't inexpensive. Because there was a lot of interesting technology, like I said, a lot of aluminum, the big wheels. The only place it was let down was the powertrain. It's kind of like what happened with the Citroen DS. It was revolutionary air suspension, but then they realized the only motor they had was the four-cylinder, you know, two-liter. Right. Yeah, they just didn't have the money. Because originally, the Citroen DS was supposed to have a flat six. Yeah. Yeah, they built over 12,000 of these, which was... Well, not a failure, but not a big success either. I, I believe they were around 32,000 when they first came out. Yeah, which seems cheap now, yeah. but you know, I think in 1999, you still had that 5% tax on any car more than $30,000. There was a, the idea was, if you bought a car that was $30,000 or under, you bought it for regular price. Anything above that was considered a luxury car, so you paid 5%. In fact, that's where the whole truck mark the luxury truck started because trucks didn't have to pay the 5% luxury tax. So they could take that 5% and say, and just build a luxury truck. That makes sense. Instead of a luxury car. I was still paying off my student loans then. I wasn't buying luxury yeah, cars. Yeah, but you know, you had the Blackwood and all these mm -hmm. kind of ones that came along. So uh, 12,000 was pretty good, but that's over the whole run. So that's, that's not, and this had well, that's to be. not a lot. Yeah, not a lot, no. And this had to be expensive to produce. I mean, the Corvair was considered a failure because they only built 1.8 million. Mm -hmm. Mustang had sold like two wow. or three million, you know, so that was, that was it. The Corvair, and, the, and in what year? Well, in, this, in the 60s, the Corvair ran yep. from 1960 to 69. And they did 1.8 million. 1.8 million, yeah. Because I know in uh, 65, yeah. the Impala, they sold over a million in 65. Yeah, alone. I mean, you know, now you, you sell, a, you, they make you president of the company, but in those days, mm -hmm. the numbers were so, you know, the foreign car market was for like weirdos, you know, <laughs> you know earth shoes yeah. and, you know, four cylinders. Mm -hmm. Why do I get a V8, you know? Like, it's, it's such a divided thing. I, I suppose there are people who have taken these and modified this engine, probably using some modern fuel injection and other things. Have you ever driven one? Actually, I have dri I've driven this one. This one belongs to our friend Jeff Dunham. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, and he's, he's got I, the I trailer, Jeff. too. We, we should have uh, we should have put the trailer. We we're going to put did, Jeff in the trailer. Did you drive one of his Bradleys? I remember drive when you drive the Bradley GT, you're like a circus bear. And then, then yeah. your head's sticking out. And yeah, yeah. It was hilarious. Well, Je Jeff had talked to me about doing two of them. Yeah. I would do one for him, and then we would do another one that we would give away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He, he has the most eclectic taste in an mm -hmm. automobile. Great. But so. these ride really stiff. Yeah. It's got a very stiff ride and they're loud. Yeah. I know you're not supposed to talk on your cell phone, right. but you can't in this. Right. So, so it was a safety have that feature. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you know, they did everything except make it fast or powerful. Right. It sounded fast and powerful. It's a shame. It looked fast and powerful. If it, if it had 350 or 400 horsepower, 
Oh, they have sold oh, fifteen thousand. Yeah, I think they would have. Yeah, <laughs> sold a few more anyway. Yep. But uh, it's kind of interesting. I, let, and you know, it. Well, let's show the trunk. It. The trunk makes me laugh because there is absolutely no room in the trunk at all. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's why you bought the trailer. Yeah. I mean, look at that. There's no room. <clears throat> I mean, maybe you could get. That's where this a goes. Thin crust piece you, in you there. You fill but, it up when you put oh, yeah. this in. Yeah, you put that in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And now it won't shut. <laughs> yeah. There's, I mean, it really is. But you know something? I have an NSX. Yeah. It's there's no room in that either. It's no? almost the same thing. So this car was ahead of its time and not having any room. Yeah, and then the front is full of. Yeah, let's open the, the front. Engine. Let's show the engine. Is it right down here? Go ahead and pull that. Oh, the door only opens that far. There we go. Oh, well, that's real easy to work on. Yeah. Okay. You yeah. got the springs inside. That's why it's so short. Yeah. You're right. You could get a V8 in there, no problem. Yeah. Plenty but, of width. But they didn't really have, did Chrysler have a V8 at the time that would have been appropriate? I don't know. That's interesting. This comes down. Yeah. It's got to fit somewhere. Right there, yeah. V6, 24 valve, 200, 253 horsepower, is that what we said? Yeah. Okay, 3.5 liter, yeah. I know Chrysler had the V10 because the Viper was out. Right, right, yeah. But that would be difficult to get in here. Right, right. And why would you They had that? to have a V8 in trucks. Yeah, and then you're cannibalizing the, mm -hmm. yeah. If you need to jump start, the battery's right there in front, so that's. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, interest. I mean, the fact that a vehicle like this reached production is really unbelievable. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was shocked. I yeah. mean, I, I built the model and, and I had the idea, but I never thought it would go to production. I don't think anybody else did either. I think Chrysler was as shocked as anybody, but <clears throat> yeah. I, I think it served its purpose. It brought some excitement to the brand. People went to showrooms to see what it looked like. But just like with a lot of cars like this, yeah, there's no room, it's not practical. Then you go, but I guess the idea was you come in, you'd look at this, and then you'd buy a neon or something. But all right, let's see, let's put this back up. That's under a lot of tension. I mean, these are just so outrageous. Yes. But they're kind of cool. I mean, it, it, it's... Design-wise, it, it's actually quite fascinating. Yeah. When you take them off, you really notice the wheels are quite a ways back. Yeah. So the car that I built for Dick Marriott, we pulled these off. I actually put a 34 Ford grill shell in the front. Oh, is that right? Well, it looked like a 34 Ford. Yeah, but yeah. Just reworked it, changed the headlights, and then I built new A-arms and moved its front wheels three inches forward. By doing that, I was able to change the side panels and got rid of this little kind of a concave there that right. that's there for when the wheels turn, they don't turn into the body. Right. By moving the wheels forward, I didn't have that problem. Well, nicely done. Well, let's take it for a ride. I'd love to. Let's see what it goes like. You know, <laughs> I, I think I'm probably going to like it. Let's prowl. <laughs> I think there's more room in your Topolino. Hi, girls. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hear that roar. Let's put it in D. I forgot it had air conditioning. Feels good. You know, it doesn't go bad. Oh, oh there we go. But it's not bad. But you want to spin the tires in your hot. I know, I know. You know, it feels pretty substantial. I mean, it, it does. It's not a lot of cowl shake and everything in it. You know? No, no. It, they're they're a solid it, car. It's solid car. It's, it's well built. Thirty years old almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, twenty-five well, anyway. So we got disc brakes all the way around, stops yep. pretty nice. Independent. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad they didn't stretch it and build a four-seater version, you know. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, where's your uh, touring? I feel like I'm in the Munster Mobile, you know, Herman. There you go. They were always a bit harsh riding. Yeah. It's not bad. It's all right. It goes all right. That's not going to get you in trouble. Yeah. You know, I think it'll become a better collector car than it was as a car. Like Lamborghini Miura. As a sports car, it had its problems. It got a lot of front end lift and a few other things. But as a classic car, it's oh, it's the greatest. Beautiful. Oh, because the noise. One of my and, favorites. Yeah, oh, it, it, yeah, it's just wonderful to drive. And, you know, you can see the, see the carburetors moving in your rear view mirror and all that kind of stuff that would kill you on the road, you know. <laughs> yep. And this car would have never happened had it not been for Tom Gale. Right, right. He is a hot rodder. Yeah, Tom Gale was a hot rodder. You know, it's funny because like everybody in the car business now is a Tom Gale, meaning they're enthusiasts. You know, back even in the 90s, a lot of guys came from Whirlpool or from Zenith TVs. Now we're selling cars, you know what I mean? So they weren't car guys at heart. Whereas Tom Gale was a real car guy. He'd yes. come to the garage a couple of times. And very nice guy. He built a hot rod and competed for uh, yeah, that's the right. America's Most Beautiful Roaster. Right, right. Award. You know, it's, it dries very nice. I'm surprised. It has aged really well. It has aged well. It, it rides smoother, I think, because the shocks are probably wore out. Right, right. <laughs> but this car rides better than what I remember it riding like. Yeah, I don't find it to be. I like a firm ride in a car anyway. Yeah. I, I don't know why I expected this to be spindly and all over the road, but it, it feels really solid. It was just not practical, you know, and $32,000 was, what, $65,000 now maybe? I probably. mean, when this is 30000 you could probably get base model cars for under twenty. Right. You know, so it was, well, yeah. Right. You couldn't go to a grocery store. No. I mean, shifting this, if it had a manual, boy, it'd be tricky. It's pretty cramped in here. Yeah. But the big wheels and tires give it a reasonably good ride. You know, this thing handles okay. I'm just stunned at how solid it is. I really expected the hood to be going every well, time. it doesn't have many miles on it. No, it doesn't. What's it got? 16. What do we got? 7,609 7, miles. 7,000 miles, yeah, yeah. It's still new. Yeah. And it's not bad with the top down. I've actually never been in them with the top down. Boy, you've only the, been in with the top up? Every time I've ever been in yeah. it, the top has been up, and they're really loud inside. This isn't so bad. No, this is actually very nice. I, you know, I guess this is like buying a Harley dresser. You yeah. know, you really you buy it for fun. You, you can't really, well, you really got, take a trip you in You got bags or, on that. You got more room. You got more room in the Harley. Yeah, but <laughs> you do, actually, when you think about yeah. it. Sight lines are good. You know, I thought when I sat in it, I'd be looking right into this windshield frame, and I'm not. No, the the human factor is great in this car. Yeah. Difficult to see. You got to know your car. Yeah. To you know before you drive it. See where those fenders are. You can't are. see where the wheels are. Oh, I know that. Yeah. Was that a big break for you that Chrysler chose to take your design? I mean, did that really, really was, set things rolling? Meeting Tom Gale, you know, was a great opportunity for right. me. And then having gone to work with Boyd, you know, I right. met Tom would come by Boyd's and we were friends and we talked about the show cars that they were doing. And when I built the uh, Sniper with Troy Trepanier, right? you know, it was a 53 Belvedere. Right. And we were talking about what motor to put in it. And Troy said, you know, it'd be pretty cool to put the V10 in it from a Viper. Right, right. So I was headed to Detroit with Boyd and I took the drawings of the sniper that I had done and I presented them to Tom and he says, how would you like a whole Viper? So he gave us a Viper coupe before they were even selling them. Wow. And we brought that back to uh, Mantino, Illinois and tore it apart and used the entire drivetrain underneath that car, underneath the sniper. Oh, that was great. Oh, very and, cool. And those types of things would have never happened had I not gone to Art Center. I mean, that was 
more than acceptable acceleration for the period 25 years ago. Not bad. I think at the period, the time that it came out, hot rodders all wanted a V8. Right, right. So it, it didn't matter what the performance was, yeah. it's a V6. Yeah. Had right. the Ford GT been out right. at the time this came out, Right, right. this could have been more successful. Right. Because people will accept a V6 now. Look at all the Ford trucks. An F-150 has yeah. a V6 in it now. How has the custom car business changed from your point of view since you started? Better, worse, same? Um, it just changes with what people want. Right. You know, it used to be everybody wanted a 32 Ford. Right. Now everybody wants a 69 Mustang or a Camaro. Right, right. Now yeah, how about, how about um, is it much more expensive to do a car now than it used yes. to be? Yeah. Well, the level of quality has gotten better right. and better and better, and that's what people expect. Right. So people will spend more money to build a nice car. Well, the funny thing is when I talk to young people, by that mean, I mean people under 35 or so, and they drive like a, a mid-70s, like a stock GTO or 442. Hey, why are the brakes so hard to put? Whoa, why not? You know, everything requires a lot more pedal pressure. You know, it was because of, let's say, my lack of uh, desire to own a Prowler. Right. Because of the way it was built. That's what led to me building the Hemisphere. Oh, okay. Which was my model. Sure, the sure. The coupe version with the mid-engine. Yeah, yeah. With some real power. Yeah, that was a great car. Who has right. that now? I still own the green one. Oh, that's great. Okay, good, good. I mean, do you feel like, well, I guess exactly like an artist who sells a painting, you don't want to sell it, but you got to make a living at it, and then you hate to see him go. You know, it's like, like I asked you, what car would you keep? I can't let go of them either. Right, I know, I know. <laughs> I don't know why I thought that front tire would be bouncing like a, a basketball, but you know what, it's stable. It stops well. There's not a lot of wind noise at this speed. No, it's not bad at all. Because we can have a conversation. Yeah, exactly. I've been in cars that you can't. Right, right. I'll bet you don't find any of these with 70 or 80,000 miles on them. I think everybody just sort of bought them as collector cars. Yeah, it was, it's interesting that it's such low mileage. Yeah. It was also interesting that this was released as a Plymouth. Yeah. And then when Plymouth went away, then yeah. they sold this as a Chrysler. Right, right. But you could take a trip in this thing, assuming you didn't want to have to carry a toothbrush and a few other things, you know? Well, if you have your CD, you have no room for it. Right, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> the CD is great, and it's just a, yes. the Prowler song. Perfect day for a car like this. It is. But you know, when you put the roof up, it's watertight, and it seals pretty good. I mean, it's not a bad... You know, I think it's a fun collector car. It just wasn't a practical car. What, what are they selling for now? I don't think they're outrageous. I haven't priced one in quite a while. But I guess if you want to Google, you probably see them in the mid 30s, probably something yeah. like. You, you probably. So they've maintained their value. Well, not really, because everything is 10 times what it was. You yeah. know. Right, but if you paid 30,000 back in '99 when this was sold. Yeah. You can get your money back. Yeah, if you call it's like not worth what it was yeah. if you just had it. Right, right. But back then, for 30 down, you put a down payment on a house. Now right. you can get a sandwich. <laughs> you know, the rear view mirrors are clear. I'm not getting this, you know? Right. Yeah. I think just the shock of an automatic and a V6 is what freak people out. Because it can't be that heavy. I don't know what they weighed. I don't remember. I bet it's around 3,000 pounds. A lot of aluminum in it. Oh, yeah. we prowling now. That's not bad. That's pretty decent. Not bad, not bad. But like I say, back then, hot rodders wanted a V8. I feel I have unfairly been beating this car up for years, but it's actually pretty nice. It's pretty good. I would say so also. But almost every magazine review you read just beat it up for not being faster than a Mustang or a Corvette or something. It's like a beach car almost, I think. Like a Myers Manx. Yeah, yeah, kind of like that. Well, I have to say, this has changed my outlook on the Prowler. You know, we all have uh, prejudices about certain cars or certain people, whatever, and they're not fair until you actually really experience it. And I realized everything I knew about this car 
pretty much I had read about it, as right. opposed to actually, you, and you know, it's, maybe it's because I'm older and I'm not that, I've got plenty of fast stuff. This is just kind of a fun car to drive, and, 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 and kind of silly in an odd way, so it's I, good. I think if this car came out today, yeah. It would have done better than it did back then because, I, I, I agree because with that. the V6 is right. accepted today. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's in the F-150. It's in the Ford GT. Well, thanks for making it possible. Thank you, Chip. Good hey, job. I, I was I was as shocked as everybody when it came out. Yeah. But like I say, that's that's a you know my hats off to Tom Gale and yeah. his team. All I did was inspire it. Yeah. Well, that's uh, inspiration is a big part of it. You know, I've been lucky and blessed to be able to yeah. inspire several projects. Yeah, you inspired and a lot of projects. And a lot of home builds as well, and a, and a lot of people through the TV show. Very good. So, Chip Foose, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, my friend. And thanks for doing this sketch back in the day and giving us a chance to drive this. Thanks for we'll having me. We'll see you next week. Today. If you get a chance to drive one of these, I think you might like it. Give it a shot.